sound and logical. Hey, what's happening, people? This is Joel. I'm back with a new video. Just want to welcome everybody that's tuning in. What I'm going to talk about now is just a continuation of my explanation of why I now think the Bible is myth versus what I used to think. You already got uh, part one, two, and three. This will really be part four. And really, this one here is going to give you the real bulk or the real meat of what convinced me of that. That is information regarding the person known as Moses. That particular character. And he's really the central figure in the Old Testament. Why? Because tradition says he's the one that wrote uh, the first four books. He's the one behind the prophecies such as Deuteronomy. Those are supposed to be his words. So if he's not real, that's a vital problem for the historical nature of the Bible. That's vital. So I wanted to start out. I'm going to get right into it. First, I wanted to read something in the Septuagint. This is actually something that I wanted to put in the first one, in part one, but I forgot. So I'll read it now real quick, and then we'll get into this thing. This is talking about, this is actually the introduction in the Septuagint. If you have a Septuagint, you can read this in the introduction. It's telling you about how it was put together. Now listen to this. The history of the origin of this translation was embellished with various fables at so early a period that it's been a work of patient critical research in later times to bring into plain light the facts which may be regarded as well authenticated. So first it's saying the history of the origin of this translation where this translation comes from has been embellished with various fables then it says we need not wonder that but little is known with accuracy on this subject let me read that again it says we need not wonder that but little is known with accuracy on this subject for with regard to the ancient versions of the scriptures in general we possess no information whatsoever as to the time or place of their execution or by whom they were made. Again, we possess no information whatsoever as to the time or place or their execution or by whom they were made. No information. So I just want to put that out there. So we can't validate who wrote the Old Testament or when it was written or in other words where they got the copy of the Septuagint because that's a copy and what they're saying is we can't validate any information on the originals like for example Deuteronomy 28 where they talk about the ships all that is supposed to be Moses's words so if we can't confirm that this poses a problem so let's get into the figure of Moses the story of Moses and why I'm telling you that it's mythology this is what I believe now I'm not telling you guys what to believe you can believe what you want I'm just letting you know where I'm at and these are the reasons that I'm breaking down why I now think that he's a mythical character and if you look up Moses most scholars will say he's a mythical character but anyway so first I'm gonna read from the Oxford companion to world mythology it's gonna let you know that uh, the story of Moses like I said according to a lot of the scholars is based on a myth so real quick this is what it says it says the life of Moses contains elements canonical and apocryphal that mark him as a true mythic hero and certainly he is Judaism's greatest hero and central figure in Hebrew mythology the book of Exodus in the Torah we learn that Hebrews serving as enslaved workers in Egypt had become so numerous that the Pharaoh ordered that all newborn Hebrew boys be thrown into the Nile to drown 
This edict placed the boy who would become Moses in the position of so many representatives of the divine child threatened by a wicked king. In other words, this is the topic of a lot of the myths. As in so many of these myths, the child is, in a sense, abandoned and adopted. In the Moses story, a mother of the Levite clan placed her baby in a, water, a watertight reed basket and set him afloat in the river to avoid the massacre of the innocents. And the boy's sister, Miriam, I'm sorry, Miriam, watched as the basket was discovered by a daughter of the Pharaoh, who immediately adopted the child. So it goes on to say, the leaving of the baby in the basket on a river ties Moses to the unusual beginnings of several mythological and legendary heroes, including, for instance, Sargon of Akkad and Siegfried in Germany. Because that's the thing about uh, hero myths. Whenever you do, and in that word hero, that can be connected back to Heru, which goes back to the Heru and Set story of Egypt. And a lot of the hero mythologies stem from that that's why they all sound similar in a lot of ways especially when you're dealing with solar deities and the mythology surrounding them you'll have similar scenarios with that and Moses is no different that's what we're about to see now you got people that don't understand this and uh, because their idea of truth is limited to um, the Bible and particularly Jesus they can't see past that so whenever they see movies or whatever, they'll say, oh, that's really talking about Jesus. Yeah, like the Matrix. See, that's talking about the Messiah. The Avengers is really talking about Christ. and Black Panther is really talking about Christ. I don't even see how you can really try to say that one is talking about Jesus because the movie itself references Egyptian guys in it. Yeah, man, that Captain Underpants, that's deep, man. It's really talking about the Messiah. You know, he was at a lowly state and he was humbled. They took all his clothes and then they put a, a, a red robe on him and mocked him. Oh, man, that's deep, man. Yeah, man, that's what that Captain Underpants is really tumble. They'll probably do that one next. But my point is this stuff is recycled. So how does this tie to another myth or a mythical story if it's literal? So let's look at Sargon, the Sargon myth, and see what we can find out. This is from the Oxford Companion to World Mythology, 3, 4 to 7. Sargon is the Akkadian Semite king, and it says he united and ruled the lands of Sumer and Akkad in Mesopotamia between 2335 and 2279 BC. And it says, like many of the early Mesopotamian kings, he became the source of myths and legends. Sargon was said to have been born of a virgin which I'm going to get into when I deal with Isis and Mary oh, but that's part of it it says in this myth he was hidden in a basket released into a river and adopted some say by a palm grower this sequence of events ties him to other monomythic hero stories including those of Moses it says later Sargon gained support of the goddess Ishtar and rose to kingship. So if you notice, already we have the story of Moses showing up in the myth of Sargon. It says he was hidden in a basket at birth, released into a river, and he was adopted. So already we, we have to ask ourselves, why is it that uh, something that sounds exactly like Moses' birth is being applied to Sargon which would have which is a myth which took place which existed before that event should have happened anyway the main date for the exodus the favorite one that people like to give out is around 1250 BC there's a lot of different dates that they use which which I guess makes sense because it's pretty difficult to pinpoint a date of something that didn't happen that's why there's so many dates but the main one that they like is 1250. And uh, even if you go back 2000 BC, still that myth of Sargon existed, which matches up perfectly with Moses. 
these stories come from older myths because if you go to different cultures if you look at some of the uh, myths of a whole lot of different cultures you'll run into some of the same stories that you read in the Bible which would have predated those events and somebody has to explain that but see the thing is uh, when when people have a belief system they condemn other people that don't agree you know you even got people out there that will teach that if someone is if someone doesn't believe in Jesus you are supposed to get emotional you're supposed to get angry at them but then they'll turn around and teach that if you attack people that don't believe like you and they get angry they need to chill out they shouldn't get angry this is the religious mindset that a lot of us have but uh, in this book did Moses exist now check this out this is page 200 now it says concerning the Exodus In keeping with this ruminant theme, the Mendes steel contains a representation of a ram with a disc and horns. Remember that, Mendes. We talk about the goat of Mendes, right? It says a representation of a ram with a disc and horns along with in the inscription, the sacred ram god, the great god, the life of Ra, the generative ram, the prince of young women, the king, the ram, the life of Ra, the ram, the life of Osiris, and the ram of rams, the prince of princes. So these are all the titles of that ram that is referred to in this Mendy steel, okay? Horus, the child, is deemed the son of the ram god as well, they're saying. As we can see, there's a tremendous focus on the viral ram associated with divinity, the pharaoh, and the sun. Throughout the Pentateuch, too great emphasis is placed on the sacred ram, sacrifice on a variety of occasions in order to please and appease Yahweh, including all through the Exodus story. So we know about that. Basically, they're saying the concept of the holy ram, the Osiris, the life of Osiris, that legend spills over in the story of the Exodus because you have God talking about killing lambs or uh, rams and so forth. Now it says in this regard Orthodox Jewish Rabbi Avaram Greenbaum recounts the tradition of the Exodus in the spring as occurring in the zodiacal sign of Aries. So in this case the Exodus would represent the movement of the sun out of the desolate winter signs into the promised land or meadows of spring so that movement of the sun right because we're going to see a lot of these deities are sun deities but the astrological meaning can be connected in this way this is why you have the term pass over because this is how the sun passes over that part of the year so to speak or that season astrologically as part of the coming out of Egypt tradition. Diodorus tells us. We got ancient commentaries on different myths from the people back then to let you know. This is also why it doesn't matter if you know the Medunetter or not, or the hieroglyphics or not. We have people back then that let you know what they said. But I'll get into more of that later. My point is, if you have people that have commentary on not only Egyptian myths but other myths of people in antiquity and they match up that means they're probably telling some truth. Diodorus tells the story of Osiris leaving Egypt to travel to India spreading viniculture along the way. The same tale of traveling to India is told of Osiris's Greek counterpart Dionysus or Bacchus said to have civilized a new land. So the Greek god Dionysus, according to Diodorus, is based on Osiris, the Egyptian god. And he goes on, and what, what he says is, it is moreover reported that Osiris being a prince of a public spirit and very ambitious of glory, raised a great army with which he resolved to go through all parts of the world 
that were inhabited and to teach men how to plant vines and to sow wheat and barley this is what Osiris did pay attention plant vines and to sow wheat and barley see when they gave you that Prince of Egypt when Hollywood gave you that they're giving you a hint hint in the Egyptian text Osiris Horus and others are called by many divine epithets including Lord of Lords King of Kings and Prince among Princes like Dionysus Osiris is associated with viniculture and the two figures are identified clearly with each other in Diodorus's mind who Avers the legendary Greek poet and prophet Orpheus brought Osiris worship to Greece and made the god into a Greek Dionysus slash Bacchus so Bacchus is just another version of Dionysus so remember these names and it's gonna come together I'm just getting you familiar with some of this mythology and what people said about it back in the day it says in the Osiris Dionysus myth we see motives similar to the mosaic tale including an origin in Egypt of a prince who leads an army of warriors on a civilizing journey in the context of a divine mission like Moses Osiris is depicted as accompanied by his brother according to Diodorus 117 this is what it says then marching out of Egypt he began his expedition taking along with him his brother whom the Greeks called Apollo now you might say why should we believe anything that these guys were saying you know why should we trust any of these accounts of what they think the myths were talking about back then what if they're lying well this is the thing if you compare it to if you actually read the myths you can see that they match up all right give you an example how this breaks down before we get too deep into Dionysus I want to stop with and talk about Hermes for a minute now look Apollo is what the Sun God matter of fact the word it talks about it means light bringer bringing the light this is what Apollo is so if you read the myth of Mercury it will tell you that he has this staff you'll see him pictured with a staff or a magical wand that has snakes on the top of it which is exactly what Moses had so this magical rod it goes on to say in producing assorted miracles the prophet's rod is not unique but represents a magical stick used by a number of other mythical characters such as the Greek god Mercury slash Hermes the caduceus or rod of mercury is well known in poetic fables it is another copy of the rod of Moses he mercury or Hermes is also reported to have wrought a multitude of miracles by this rod and particularly he is said to kill and make alive to send the souls to the invisible world and bring them back from thence Homer represents mercury taking his rod to work miracles precisely in the same way as God commands Moses to take his and who gave Mercury his wand? Apollo, his brother. Who was Aaron? If you uh, look at what Apollo is, that's a sun god. He's a sun deity, which represents bringing the light. What's Aaron's name mean? It means light bringer in Hebrew, if you look it up. Mercury is also called the messenger of God. He was the one that brings the message from Zeus. This is why you'll see that symbol on hospitals where you see that rod with the snakes. Now, those that are ignorant and, and don't really know where that comes from, they may assume that that symbol is based on the Moses story. All right. So if someone tells you, oh, that's based on Moses, I can understand that if they're ignorant of the symbol being around before Moses but if somebody tells you that's a symbol of the story of Moses only and they know good and well that there was a symbol before Moses of that very same thing then that is a con man because if it's based on Moses why was there already a symbol like that during the time of Moses and 
you can trace that very same symbol back to Egypt and I'll get to that in a minute look it up just on a side note Apollo Mercury's brother right he had a twin sister which was Artemis which I talked about in another video as well she is a moon goddess she is a huntress remember if you haven't seen part three Bible equals myth check that out I connected her with uh, Deborah and Artemis was also a prophetess now who was Aaron's sister Aaron's sister was Miriam who was what a prophetess and you can also connect Artemis back to Isis if you do your research and it's funny that you can connect her to Isis because Isis is the very one that uh, was the one guiding Osiris that story about being put in a basket or a box and sent down the stream amongst the reeds amongst the sea of reeds and you can connect Artemis to Isis and it's funny that Apollo's sister Miriam is also a prophetess and she's the very one that guided Moses as a baby while he was in that basket and again that whole Mary Miriam you can connect her even by name Miriam to Mary because that's another version of the same goddess it leads you all back to Egyptian mythology to take it even further just on a, another side note there is a story where Mercury is involved in a situation with Zeus where Zeus had a lover named Lo, right? And his wife Hera was jealous and banished Lo away from Zeus to Egypt. Which sounds an awful lot like Abraham and Sarah. So we should look into that probably, right? But what Hera did was to guard Lo, so Zeus couldn't get to him. She had a giant. She sent a giant to guard her, right? And the giant's name is Argus. And he's described as having a hundred eyes. He's also called the all-seeing one, right? So Zeus wants to get rid of this giant. Who does he send? He sends Hermes to get rid of the giant so he can get the low right which low is depicted as a cow which they'll also tell you low can be connected to Isis keep in mind that cow and the bull horns because that represents the moon moon goddesses all that kind of stuff is all connected but anyway Mercury went to go kill the giant how does he kill the giant he uses a flute or a musical instrument because Hermes is also supposed to be the father of music musical instruments so Mercury uses his musical instrument or flute to put the giant to sleep did anybody do that in the Bible and he did that by transforming into a shepherd so we got a shepherd and Mercury is always depicted as a young boy as well. So you got a shepherd boy putting a giant to sleep and while he's asleep he kills the giant by putting a stone through his head. And not only that but he also cuts his head off and you can see pictures of Hermes with the giant's head cut off and him stepping on the head there's your David right there the question is why is it that these stories match up with ancient pagan mythology so much but anyway so this was a description 
and uh, the Greek commentators of these myths they'll tell you that these characters are based on older Egyptian characters and they'll tell you Mercury is based on Thoth uh, a better description of the word is Tehuth which goes to Tehuti which is the Egyptian god of knowledge and wisdom that's Mercury and if you notice the god Tehuti he's identified with stone tablets he's identified with inventing the alphabet or writing he's also the messenger of God just like Mercury's the messenger of God he brings the message and if you notice his head looks like an ibis because that's a sacred bird to the Egyptians why is it a sacred bird because they kill snakes they get rid of snakes they save man from snakes and that's exactly what Moses did how did he do that with the bronze serpent which is the same thing Hermes has you see where we going with all this so Tehuti is depicted as the god of writing and the god of wisdom and another thing that's funny about that is he's also depicted as a baboon so that's why you have the character Rafiki in the Lion King and he's doing all the prophesying and giving you the message by writing everything down that's what Rafiki is that's Tehuti so now let's look at another god an ancient Mesopotamian Babylonian god named Nabu this is Wikipedia Encyclopedia Britannica it says Nabu was worshipped by the Babylonians and the Assyrians Nabu was worshipped in Babylon's sister city or Sippa where his statue was moved to Babylon each new year so that he could pay his respects to his father. Nabu's symbol was a stylus resting on a tablet. Clay tablets with a special calligraphic skill were used as offerings at Nabu's temple. It says Nabu was the patron god of scribes, literacy, and wisdom. He was also the inventor of writing, a divine scribe, and the patron god of the rational arts. And due to his role as an oracle, Nabu was associated with the Mesopotamian moon god Sin. So, the other way that you would pronounce Nabu is Nebo which is how he's described in the Bible. He's called Nebo. This is why in the Bible, what do you have? You got Mount Nebo. Connected with Moses. That's where he supposedly died. And Moses also traveled in the what? Wilderness of sin. A lot of uh, Christian tradition will hold Moses as the inventor of the alphabet I believe Josephus says that about Moses which again these writings are pointing you to these characters they're pointing you back to these myths Nabu the biblical Nebo and another thing about the meaning of the word Nabu it could mean speaking it could mean pronouncing or announcing And one more, this is from Ancient History Encyclopedia about Nabu. Check this out. It says, Nabu, sometimes known as Tutu. No surprise there, since we already connected it to Tehuti, right? It says, is the Babylonian god of wisdom, learning, prophecy, scribes, and writing, just like Tehuti, and was also responsible for the abundant harvest and all growing things his name means the announcer which refers to his prophetic and creative powers in calling forth words the harvest and other plant life sounds like Osiris 
and the visions of prophecies. Nabu himself was developed from the earlier Sumerian goddess of writing and accounts, Nasiba, also known as Nidaba or Nisaba, who was attested to be who was attested to in the early dynastic period 3150 to 2686 BCE. Again, way before the biblical stories of the Exodus. Nabu became increasingly popular during the old Babylonian period, 2000 to 1600 BC, which again would still be before the Exodus, and particularly in the reign of King Hammurabi. In some myths, Nisaba is Nabu's wife and divine assistant in keeping the records and maintaining the library of the gods. Listen, much in the same way as the goddess Seashot worked with Thoth in Egypt. Originally regarded as the vizier and scribe of the god Marduk. Following the Kassite period, 1595 BCE, Nabu was regularly depicted as Marduk's son and almost equal to him in power. His symbol was a wedge-shaped cuneiform mark or a stylus at rest upon a writing tablet. But he was also depicted as a bearded man in royal garb. That's why you always see Moses as a bearded man, right? Holding a stylus, standing on the back of a snake dragon. Known as the Mashusu dragon, a powerful protective spirit associated with Marduk and other gods. Now listen, it says, after Marduk, Nabu was the most important god of the Babylonians. Among his many important duties was traveling from Borsippa to Babylon to visit his father during the Akidu festival, marking the beginning of the year. Keep that in mind, because it says, during the Akidu festival, marking the beginning of the new year, Nabu was associated with the goddess Nasaba by the Sumerians and the god Thoth by the Egyptians, Apollo by the Greeks, and Mercury by the Romans. Which really Hermes should be included in there as far as the Greeks. Again, you can see it's all connected. He is referred to in the Bible as Nebo. Now listen, it says, Writing was invented in Mesopotamia by the Sumerians, 3500 to 3000 BCE, known as cuneiform, and consisting of wedge-shaped marks made in wet clay, which was then set to dry. So we're dealing with when writing in stone started. Although this writing system most likely developed due to trade and the need to send messages over long distances, it was considered, as it was in Egypt, a gift of the gods and primarily of Nabu. So getting, again, God of, this is a messenger of the gods, God of writing, and they considered it when they sent messages by stone tablets, writing on stone tablets, that was considered a gift from God that they could do that. So you can understand where the myth of someone going up into a mountain, which we'll get into, receiving stone tablets from God, stone writing being a gift from God. Do you see the connection here? It goes on. Here's a little quote from uh, A. Wallace Budge. He says, He was endowed with great wisdom like his father, and he acted as a scribe to the gods. He had charge of the tablet of the fate of the gods and had the power to the power of prolonging the days of men. Like the Egyptian Thoth or Tahuti, his eyes traveled over the circuit of the heavens and all over the earth. He was the personification of knowledge and as a god of vegetation he caused the earth to produce abundant crops right remember that now Nabu was featured in the Babylonian festival the Akidu festival I mentioned listen to this arguably the most important the city celebrated to honor the gods and the harvest at the beginning 
of each new year. The Mesopotamians celebrated many festivals in honor of their gods, but the most important was the Akitu festival. The celebration was observed with varying rituals all over the region. Scholar Stephen Bertman notes, in some communities like Babylon, the ceremonies were conducted once a year immediately after the barley harvest in March. At the time of the spring equinox, barley was Mesopotamians' chief grain. In other communities like Ur, there were two celebrations a year, one at the time of harvest, one at the time of the harvest, and the other in September, when now seed was sown. Because the Mesopotamians looked upon the spring equinox as the beginning of their year. The harvest, Akitu, was also a New Year's holiday and a time of added celebration. So what do you have? The beginning of the year was a time of barley harvest. Now maybe we can understand where the significance of Abib comes from. Beginning of the year. These are... <laughs> This is the origin of your Passover festivals, your first fruits. Now, your Bible says that God instituted that that was the first year, that that was the first month of the year to Israelites. That was supposed to be theirs only. So why is it that these people, before that ever happened, had the same exact festivals? But it even goes deeper than that. It says the festival it says the festival lasted for 12 days with the first 6 devoted to religious devoted to religious observances by the priests of Marduk at Babylon and the last a grand public event involving the procession which carried Marduk's statue throughout the streets of Babylon so the festival and remember this is done in the beginning in March beginning of the year in March and in the fall in September it says that it was first celebrated the first six days it was a 12-day celebration the first six days were religious observances by the priests what do you got in the Bible you got unleavened bread six-day festival but with that they add a celebration day at the end same thing with the celebration in September tabernacle same thing six days and then you add a day for the celebration but you see where this stuff comes from though now maybe you can understand why the Jews have two so-called New Year's because it's all Babylonian it's Babylonian tradition and what do they call the first month? They call it Nisan. That's not even a Hebrew word. That's a Babylonian word. And Nisan is connected with Aries, which is a zodiac sign. And what is Aries? A ram. So again, in the beginning of the year, this is all spring equinox. This is Babylonian tradition. This is why, what do you do when uh, in, the, in the book, when Israel wanted to pronounce something, you wanted to pronounce a message, you blew the shofar or you blew the ram's horn. How do you get that announcement or message across through that ram, <laughs> through the ram's horn, right? It says, after this ceremony, the king joined the priests in praying to the gods and sacrifices were made to the planet Mercury. <laughs> The star of Marduk, also associated with Nabu. And another thing, you heard me mention in part one about the treaties of Estardan. That sounds like the curses in Deuteronomy, right? 
Well, guess where that was placed? That was in the Temple of Nabu. Temple of Nebo, that's where that was found. So it's funny, you have uh, this figure Moses is based on, and that's where you find writings that sounds just like Deuteronomy, which is supposed to be his prophesied words in the Bible. Uh, this, these are way too many coincidences for me and also Nabu or Nebo had a wing or uh, he had a horned crown so look if you notice Donatello's David statue here check out how he looks why does he have the same exact hat as Mercury because you can see they're one and the same looks just like Mercury right this is why you also have Michelangelo's Moses with horns on his head I don't know if you guys ever noticed that now maybe you can understand why they don't expect you to know that because these people were initiates into esoteric hermetic knowledge even though on the surface people thought you know these artists were catholic or whatever but they're initiates so they're going to signal each other what they're really talking about so they had understanding of what these characters and stories really are they just don't want you to know sound and logical.